Okay. Um, thank you for sticking with us, and thank you to the organizers again for organizing what is a conference that has shown us all of your progress to date. And that progress gives a lot of confidence for where I think this field is and what this talk will in part be about. Um, and there's an enormous number of progress in this field for many reasons, all of which we're seeing here today. Some of which because the debates that happened five, 10 years ago have quiesced and the overzealous skeptics have gone relatively quiet. And I think what that means is we are in a extraordinary position today to take the big next step in conventionalizing holobiont biology. So that when we open up the textbooks, we see this front and center, an unsiloed biology without separation of hosts and microbes, but it all together in, a, in the way that nature really is. And so um, I leave this conference with an enormous amount of confidence because of all these things coming together right now. I hope you do too. So let's talk about that. Um, actually, 20 years ago in June, uh, Carl Woese, one of my icons, published a paper that I would recommend everybody read called A New Biology for a New Century. And while you read this quote, I want you to sort of uh, get a summary of this, which is essentially, he was a prophet. He looked backwards and said, the 1900s, the, the early 2000s, really led us to a point that we're ending in the early 2000s in which biology was mostly an engineering discipline where it looked at the cell as a machine and the genes would make that machine and we could deconstruct that system because it was an engineered machine. And he said, in fact, that those days are absolutely over and it's time to turn the page to one that's more complex, to one where we put the organism back in the environment, to one where we see the complexity that we've all talked about today. And this quote comes from that paper. And I think we are realizing his vision, though he's passed away some 20 years later. And it's a cornerstone of, I think, where this field will, will continue to have a lot of momentum from. With that spirit, um, I like to think of the life science as having three errors or epochs uh, that really can be simplified into uh, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, published in the 1859. And of course, his book was completely sterile. It had no mention of bacteria or microbes, though we probably knew about it at the time. Um, it was a theory, in fact, built on observations of animals and plants. So it's kind of astounding how well that book has stood up, given that we are now in a microbe-dominated world in which those principles, of course, extend to. So I would argue that in 1859, in the decades after, we were in what we call the eukaryocentric phase, um, where the visible world had all the focus. And then if you march forward into the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, there's this era of the modern synthesis in which Mendel's laws are rediscovered. They're combined back with Darwinian theory, and all of a sudden you have evolutionary genetics taking off for about 100 years. And that was in part because a lot of Drosophila biologists were mapping mutations induced by uh, X-ray radiation to chromosomes, and we were seeing the machine, essentially, and how it might work from a genetic perspective. That generated an era what I would like to think of as very nucleocentric, that the focus became on the nucleus of things we could see. And of course, in the last two decades, and because of Carl Woese's work and his legacy and his students, we've seen that the world is much more complex, and that is that the microbes rule the biosphere. And so arguably, I think what we are doing in this field right now and what we're all progressing towards is that we see the value of holism, not on its own, but in combination with reductionism in these other periods, and that the best science will be done by having this eyes up view of holistic complexity and trying to resolve it with reductionist techniques rather than the eyes down view where you only look at the machine and try and reduce it, and then you forget about the organism and its environment and all the complexity it carries. Uh, so we are kind of essentially part of this epoch that's forming right now, uh, and I think we can take big steps forward from, from where we've been in the past decade. So, um, Yes, one of the ways in which things could change is if you opened up a textbook and you see these canonical, on the left, the canonical model of biological levels of hierarchy and organization, where we, of course, we start with the atom and then we go to the molecule and then we go to the organelle and then we go to the cell and then we go to the organism and then you have to stop. 
Because true for a single-celled organism like a bacteria, that model works quite well. But for a animal or plant or ho complex host microbe system, you get to the organism and you have a different view because that organism is made up of both host cells and microbial cells. And so if we really push this theme forward, if we really are committed to it, there are lots of things that can change, including the hierarchy of biological levels in which we introduce a holobiont into this hierarchy. And then above that, you get holobiont populations, holobiont communities, and, and ultimately to the biosphere. Um, we're thinking about, certainly, as a, a relevant factor for what holobiont biology does to biology. Okay, and in terms of timelines, I would argue that the 1800s and 1900s, so the epochs one and two really fit well into the standard model, but there's opportunity for the current century to really introduce new ideas about where we can take biology. And I wanna continue that theme throughout this talk in a number of different ways, and I'll especially end on that in the latter part of the talk. So what is a holobiont made of? Um, I use this because I know you know the answer, but I wanna remind you that when we look at, let's say, an animal or plant, and we start with the nuclear genome, it's important to remember that the nuclear genome is not this kumbaya of helpful genes. That in that genome is pa parasitic genetic elements, selfish elements that are transposons, sex chromosomes that drive, and so it's okay to look at the flip side of that, which is the microbiome, and embrace the complexity of both harmful microbes and helpful microbes, because within our own genomes, we have harmful genes and helpful genes. And of course, the nuclear genome is transmitted mostly vertically, but not always. So there is some scale of continuum of horizontal transmission there. So let's now add the microbiome part into that model. And when you add the microbiome part into that model, of course, you get the complexity of the microbiome and all of its genomic material, which can orders of magnitude increase genetic variation. Within that microbiome are all these elements that can be helpful or harmful from viruses to protists. And of course, with the microbiome, there's variation on a theme of vertical and horizontal transmission. And some systems will have more or less vertical transmission and more or less horizontal transmission. And this is really the complexity that I think is opportune for holobiont biologists to think about, to model mathematically, and to study experimentally to understand what systems contribute in what manner to this more complex model where we embrace microbiomes as part of the holobiont and their transmission route variation. Okay, so in that spirit then, how do we get a new holobiont lineage? How do holobiont lineages diversify? And this is a topic that I've thought about for a couple decades since I was a graduate student. And of course, I wanna make the point that the Rosenbergs really encapsulated the hologenome concept under this framework. And a lot of what we, we do, what you do in this room, is really built off of those original ideas of thinking about the tethering of the nuclear genome and the microbiome as not radically different from each other, but things on a continuum. Okay, so how do you get divergence in a holobiont? Um, so what I'm showing here is on the x-axis, let's just consider nuclear genetic divergence. And then on the y-axis is reproductive isolation, so the lack of interbreeding. And at zero, all the populations are interbreeding with each other, and at one, none of the population can interbreed, or none of the two populations can interbreed with each other. So you have species, good old-fashioned biological species concept. So, of course, there should be some positive relationship between genetic divergence over time and the amount of reproductive isolation, so that when we get complete reproductive isolation at level one now, you have good species. This is what defined species units from the biological species concept for six, seven decades now. And there have been great speciation biologists that have tried to map the number and types of genetic factors that contribute to lineage divergence under this model. A closely related species pair would be on the, on the portion of the chart here, a little bit of genetic divergence, a little bit of reproductive isolation, a distantly related species, which is a good old species that has complete reproductive isolation would be at the end. So what if we add hologenomic divergence in then? Now we are adding in microorganisms to this model in which we're generating new holobionts over time. And this profoundly affects modeling of how new holobiont lineages arise, how we look at so-called species and define them, not just through a genetic lens, 
but through a symbiotic and microbe lens. So for example, an endosymbiont could come into the genetically diverging populations very early in the timeline of the speciation event and push it to complete speciation because that endosymbiont causes immediate and strong reproductive isolation. By doing so, then, the trajectory of the model changes radically to how species form. Um, it could also be that at, at the distantly related species pair, where there's a lot of genetic divergence, lots of things are changing, including divergence in the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome might directly contribute to the origin of a new holobiont lineage, if you will. And so we've done a, a lot of thinking and, and work in this area. And I just want to show you some generalized trends and some specific experiments that we've worked on. Um, so what this shows is that back in 2016 with Kevin Cole and a few others, um, we were looking at patterns of divergence age of the host clades. So on the x-axis is divergence age in the millions of years. And then on the y-axis is the strength of the microbiome distinguishability. And we looked at five different species complex. And so in the younger species complex with these tiny parasitoid wasps called Nasonia, they only diverged about a million years ago and they have the lowest amount of microbiome distinguishability. Now, on the flip side, if you go all the way to Drosophila or to those mosquito larvae up top in green, where there's almost 100 million years of divergence, you have very strong microbiome distinguishability. So evolution is telling us across this comparison that Holobionts diverge concurrently in both their genetics and in their microbiomes. Now, within each species complex, you can also look at the influence of evolution on microbiome structure. So now we've taken those five complexes, break them apart, and look at the pattern of phylosymbiosis, which essentially means the host phylogeny on one side is paralleling the microbiome dendrogram relationships on the other side, and that's derived from the beta diversity relationships. In all five cases in, this, in, these, in these systems, there's strong or moderate degrees of phylosymbiosis. So once again, host evolution is having an influence on the microbiome distinguishability even within these clades rather than comparatively across them. Okay, so if we zoom in on one of these species then, we could ask, well, what is the influence of microbes on the host evolution, on the speciation itself? Is this a common phenomenon? While we accept genes can drive new lineages, can microbes do it as well? Um, I'll remind you that the timeline for these organisms ranges from 1 million year to 108 million years. And also, if we use machine learning, we can predict with training the accuracy of what microbiome goes to what species. So in the case of these Nasonia wasps that I'll talk to you about in a second, we can train models and then have them predict which microbiome goes to what species with 90% accuracy. And this is just to emphasize that microbiomes are distinguishable of their particular host. Okay, so this is Nasonia now with an endosymbiont called Wolbachia. It's a widespread endosymbiont in half of the world's arthropod species. And in Nasonia, there are two species pairs that we're defining here, an older species pair that diverged about a million years ago, so there's a lot of reproductive isolation, and then a younger species pair that diverged about two to 300,000 years ago, give or take. And when we interbreed them, all that matters is the letters here. So V times G and G times V is we're interbreeding these species with different names. And then the self-crosses are shown flanking those. And as you can see in the older and younger species pairs, there's a dramatic collapse of hybrid production. So these are Wolbachia infected organisms or, or holobionts, and they cannot reproduce effectively with their other species. And that's because Wolbachia is causing the reproductive isolation. And in fact, I'm showing that to you through our cured version of this wasp that lacks Wolbachia, but has all the rest of the microbes. And if you interbreed them again, in this Frankenstein moment, you essentially rescue all of the hybrids that were once dead to now being almost alive or, or significantly more alive. And what that means is that Wolbachia, through a mechanism called cytoplasmic incompatibility, it affects the gametes of sperm and egg and how they develop, are essentially crucial to whether we call these species good species or not. And therefore, the holobiont view really fits this model that microbes can be crucial to divergence events. And in a similar way, we've looked at organisms or holobionts that lack Wolbachia, but then have a gut microbiome. And so this is the hindgut of a pupa in, in Nasonia, where a lot of the waste processing and excretion will happen. And these are largely uh, uh, gamma proteobacteria, so relatives of E. coli here. And in Nasonia, if you take these older species pairs and they don't have Wolbachia, they can interbreed. But then when you breed them, 
The F1s are now heterozygous, so they have a genome from one parent and the other, and they do pretty well. The F2s, however, the F2 hybrids, die at about a 90% rate. And they die because of what reason? Well, the field for decades thought that genetics was going to be the sole answer. And so for many decades, people mapped the number and types of QTL or genes that map to why these hybrids are dying. And in fact, this is what the hybrids look like when they're, when they're dead. They just don't show up around this fly carcass. And that's because the larva pupa or the larval stages are where these hybrids are dying. And so they never make it to pupation, which is what you're seeing here in these um, immature yellow pupae that are quite productive on the normal species sides, but not in the hybrid. And so if you look at the quantitative data then, and again, just the letters mean different species, and these are now Wolbachia cured, and we're looking at the F2 hybrid survival. 80 to 90% of those hybrids die. And they die with this very melanized larvae that's shown over the hybrid bars. And the melanized larvae, uh, in insects, melanin's used to encapsulate pathogens. And this looks like a hybrid that tried to capture a whole bunch of pathogens and failed during the larval stage and therefore collapsed into catastrophe and died. So this is, again, the hybrid versus the non-hybrid. The non-hybrid's very clean, not a lot of immune system activity. The melanin is shut down for the most part. And if you look at their microbiomes of a hybrid versus a non-hybrid, lo and behold, uh, the microbiomes are indeed different between the hybrids and non-hybrids. And this really gave us confidence that maybe the gut microbiomes of these hybrids are in fact part of the reason why these hybrids are dying, especially with the melanization response. And it turns out the proteus bacteria is a swarming bacteria. This is a collective behavior that bacteria use. They start swimming in the same direction because that's where the party is. And so they're all going in the same direction in the pool, going to one side of the party or the other. And the contrast is Providencia, which are these, uh, again, gamma protea bacteria. These are called swimming species. They're very solitary. They're just hanging out in each, each part of the, the pool on their own, and that's quite fine for them. And in fact, these swarming bacteria are known to be pathogenic, and, and they are pathogenic to humans. You can get urinary tract infections um, from catheters because there are swarming bacteria that are distributed from ca uh, non-sterile catheters to, to the vaginal tract. And then they get these urinary tract infections. Okay, so here's the, here's the experiment. When we cure these uh, F2 hybrids of their microbiome, also in a sort of second Frankenstein moment now, they lack any microbiome, there's no gut microbiome here, they come back to life almost to completion. And then when we put Providencia and Proteus back into the hybrids, we can reinstate a significant amount of the hybrid lethality. And so the point of all this is to reinforce how a holobiont view is affecting the ways we think about the fundamental nature of a species unit in biology. And for all its nuances, the wide acceptance of the biological species concept really doesn't embrace microbes as part of that normal process. And I think holobiont biology can tell us otherwise. And so at the end of the day, the, 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 the thing that we're learning from these kinds of studies is that there are more ways for lineages to diversify um, when you incorporate the microbiome than when you don't. And you can actually show that mathematically as well, or conceptually mathematically, that there's just a number of, increased number of routes to get a, a new animal species, if you will. And this isn't just the only system. So we, uh, during COVID, an undergraduate wanted to have a research project, so we asked her to do a literature review, and she went to work with a team and produced a whole number of animal studies where hybridization in animals from insects to mammals elicits problem in the microbiome or the metabolome, and sometimes these are affiliated with sickness or illness. And so we think this is going to be a much more widespread phenomena, and if so, the more case systems, the better, to kind of convince traditional speciation biologists that this holobiont view is going to become a crucial next phase of speciation biology. This isn't the end of that story. Um, in fact, I can think of so many ways in which this is relevant. So flies, different species of flies, can be reproductively isolated either because of their Wolbachia bacteria that cause the sperm egg incompatibility or gut bacteria that change the pheromones and mating behavior of those fly species. Um, aphid species, so there's thousands of aphid species that live on nutrient uh, depleted plants. The, the sap nutrients they take out are, are insufficient. And oftentimes they carry Buchnera symbionts that help them uh, fill in the essential amino acids that are missing from the diet. And if there are 4,000 aphid species that live on plant sap that are there because of their symbionts, then those 4,000 species arose because of the symbiosis. 
and all the diversification that happens may be intermixed with genetic divergence and microbiome divergence. So I think a hologenomic model works really well here from the incipient speciation event that led to um, the aphid lineage. These are Arabidopsis. On the top are tiny, uh, defective, uh, misshaped uh, hybrids, and on the bottom are non-hybrids. And uh, Kirsten Bombley's group a long time ago mapped the genetic factors that control why these hybrids look defunct. And in fact, they, ma they map to immune genes. And immune genes are commonly attributable to reproductive isolation and genetic incompatibilities. Immune genes are the windows into a symbiotic interaction. And yet it's strange that what the biologists sort of stop and say, look, we found the immune genes, but they're not thinking about what led those immune genes to diverge and why they go defective in hybrids. And that's where the microbes, of course, come into play that are shaping the evolution of these immune genes. And in humans, I've highlighted in yellow that the most rapidly evolving and the most genes under selection in the human genome, guess what? They are immune genes. And that's probably no surprise to us, but it's important to think that those immune genes are probably diverging because of the microbes that influence that evolution. And so that whole genomic model is really important when we start thinking about what's the part of the genome that's most rapidly evolving. It happens to be, I would say, the symbiosis part of the genome. Okay, so how do we get holobionts different from each other over time? We've sort of talked about the origin of reproductive isolation, some mechanisms, but what's actually changing in the holobiont? And I just want to remind everybody as we end this conference that on one side is a holobiont in the inner circle and and a phenotype on the outer circle. And then on the other side here is a new holobiont lineage. So it has changed in its composition and its phenotype. And you can get divergence through the very obvious model of a symbiont that will vertically transmit over time and perhaps create a new lineage of holobionts. So vertical transmission and host microbe co-speciation are very much a part of this vision, the conventional vision of how you can get divergence uh, in host microbe communities and symbioses. But really what the hologenome concept adds that's new and different is that there's horizontal microbial transmission that reshapes the composition of the holobiont and therefore the phenotype. And that in and of itself can potentially lead to dramatic changes in the origin of reproductive isolation and a new species. On top of that, I think there's another element that we don't talk enough about, which is that the microbial abundance changes that occur can change phenotype and therefore you know, change the composition of the holobiont, more or less of a microbe, and can change the phenotype as well. And so how important a switch from a low to a high abundance microbe is to holobiont functioning is also very important and maybe understudied to some degree. And so here we have this model now of how holobionts go from one lineage to another through mechanisms of reproductive isolation and types of new holobiont compositional changes. And of course, we think a lot about the evolutionary forces that might drive these changes. Both selection and drift could be relevant to why holobiont composition changes and therefore phenotype changes uh, over time. Both are important to the process. Okay, so having this view now that uh, in, in this case of Nisonia, but many other cases that there are really these two opposing forces of the scientists who might look at the individual level and the scientists who might look at the holobiont level. I think to move forward with all the progress and the momentum we have right now, there are ways we can contribute to that movement going forward. And this is what I think can change in biology uh, for the better and that you can and should be a part of. So first of all, textbooks. Um, you know, when the, when the canonical textbook of biology in the United States, Campbell, uh, looks, you, you know, has a cover like this, it's obviously missed the mark that it doesn't incorporate the holobiont view. It's focused on the visible world once again. And so we need to think about updating textbooks significantly with a holobiont view, with a more symbiotic view, with an unsiloed view of the microbes are in one chapter and the animals are in another chapter and the plants are in another chapter. Um, this is forcing our educational pipelines to sort of think in the old way but a new way would be to embrace the symbiotic nature of life and its reality from the beginning. Start with the microbes, the tree of life. Start with the microbes then generating endosymbiotic organelles, generating more complex eukaryotic cells, and then associating with complex life. This is how the textbooks uh, should read, rather than microbiology often being relegated to one of the last chapters in a textbook that focuses on eukaryotic cells. 
our approaches can change as well. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think a lot of us would love to see, and some are actually building, are, is a new view of reference databases. So instead of going to MBOL or NCBI to look at a genome of a single species in which the humans are separated from its microbes and the microbes are separated from all the microbes, it should be that we have databases that reflect the reality of nature, which is that I should, you should be able to go to the human genome and also link out to all the microbes that have been found in it and then have those microbial genomes all together. So what this is then is a unified searchable database of hologenomic material. And that is going to assist this perspective of organisms are not isolated, but organisms are together. And it just reflects the reality of nature. There's a couple, several initiatives that have actually already started this. You've heard about the Earth Hologenome Initiative from here. Um, and the Drosophila community actually made a Drosophila evolution over space and time database of hologenomic information from a couple hundred populations of Drosophila across the world, spanning, I think, about 13,000 samples. Um, and you know, this was in part done with a study that showed experimentally that introducing microbes into field caged Drosophila can shift their evolution in allele frequencies in which the microbes are putting the pressure on the host genome to change. Um, and that paper, in fact, embraced this hologenomic view and has a database that sees the future of what's relevant to Drosophila evolution. Uh, the Terra Expeditions projects have done incredible amount of marine sampling from coral to many other types of marine holobionts. And these are the types of initiatives that are just starting, but ones that you could build yourselves or we could build as a community for our particular organisms, ultimately to maybe lead to some kind of unification in the long term. Okay, what else could change? Well, um, when we do genomics, we are obviously interested in seeing the total complexity, but we're more interested in seeing how that complexity relates to traits. And when we sequence a hologenome, we get a nuclear genome, we get the organelle genomes, and we get the microbiomes. And oftentimes our goal is to take genetic variation in any of those compartments and map that genetic variation to a trait. Now, more often than not, it's a biology centered on just looking at host genomic variation and how it maps to traits. But in a holobiont world, um, we should be thinking about programs and tools that automate hologenomic level analyses that facilitate the rest of biology to go from hologenomic variation and not just genomic variation to trait mapping that incorporates the microbes. And this is built off of a century of work from uh, Ronald Fisher, who actually first coined this idea of quantitative genetics. And he published this paper in 1918, uh, in which he, he denoted that there's an infinitesimal model of genetic variants in an organism that can map to a trait. And that has led to 275,000 publications to date with quantitative genetics in it. That's a single genome focused approach. And of course, the infinitesimal model is actually a great a great extension to the microbiome and contributing that in. And what that means then is that if you do a quantitative genetic analysis, a quantitative trait locus analysis that these are often called, um, here's an example. You have fish of different size that evolved over time. And those fish diverged by genetics. And then the idea is to interbreed those fish variants, map the genes that contribute to the fish size variation. And the problem with that model is it's a single genomic focus. It's often insufficient explanatory power because it's missing the variation that the microbiome contributes. And so we, we know this term already. It's been defined by quantitative geneticists as essentially the missing heritability problem. And part of the answer to this, this problem is, of course, taking a quantitative hologenomic approach. And so I would argue that as a field, we could build a future by adding in some of these tools and programs that everyone can use. So the hologenomic approach in a quantitative sense would establish linkages between phenotypes, uh, between host genes, between microbial genes, and then also microbial taxonomy, because you kind of get both levels of information from the microbiome. And you can map all that to enhance the explanatory power of traits. Um, sometimes these are called hologenome-wide association studies. But the bottom line is, is that this is a better reflection of how we're going to explain phenotypes, which everyone is interested in. And I think if we could formalize a quantitative hologenomic program for the world to download and stick a FASTA sequence of a host genome in and a FASTA sequence uh, a file of your microbiome, and then you push a button, if that's automated, the world would take a hologenomic approach. 
right? It's, it's, it's easy enough to conceptualize and maybe do. And then I think, I think people will be very, find it very useful. Okay, so where has this been applied already? So this is a paper uh, from 2018 on essentially what I would think of as human quantitative hologenomics. And they mapped uh, human genetic variation and human gut microbiome variation to a number of different traits. And um, when the traits had both a genetic and a microbiome component to it, um, I've drawn out some of the interesting uh, traits that the microbiome contribution is about equal to the genetic contribution for HDL cholesterol, for circumference of the hip, and then for BMI body mass index. So 45%, 55%, and 65% of the mappable variation, this doesn't mean the traits explain, are explained by 65%, it just means that of the mappable variation from the whole genome, the microbiome contributes a little less or more than half of the, of the mappable information. Okay, and so this is adding incredible amounts of depth then to trait variation, and we already can see that it is, is a successful method, and if we can automate it for everybody, um, then I think we're going to have a big, big step forward in hologenomic biology. Okay, the lexicon is of course modernizing as well. Uh, I put a number of terms up here that kind of reflect the individual level view and then the holobiont level view, um, but most importantly that those metrics on the bottom show us the publication increase over time of using the words holobionts and hologenome. And for the last five years, we've been in an exponential growth phase. And really, I think this indicates that we've crossed the line. And it's time to sort of step forward and conventionalize this field with some of the tools we've been talking about, some of your visions, um, freely use the terms, and uh, continue this growth. because. There's clearly something happening in biology that is significant as this becomes uh, the way forward. What else has changed? Um, in, in very significant ways, funding and scholarship measurements have changed. Um, and so we've heard about a lot of funders who've contributed to this event and to the research going on here from all across the world, uh, from Chile to Germany to America uh, to Denmark to uh, the UK, et cetera. Um, this isn't a siloed you know, concept or niche field. This is a world embracing the field. In fact, in my home country, the NSF and NIH have funded at least 70 grants with the words holobiont and hologenome in them. And my colleague at Penn State, Jason Rasgon, has an NIH R01, so a very high level grant, uh, entitled Hologenomic Basis of West Nile Viral Competence in Culex, which transmits West Nile virus. Uh, and that's from the Vector Biology Panel uh, at the NIH. So these are now leading to centers, like the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics, the original meta-organismal center from Tom Bosch, and new ones across the world, and new units and programs such as Holo Ruminant uh, and Holo Food. Um, so when I look at the field and where it started uh, just about 10 years ago in terms of it getting traction and where it is now, everything says we are pushing and moving and succeeding and that change in perspective of succeeding old views with new views is happening right underneath our feet. Um, another example of this is I was just visiting Joan in Hawaii, uh, who, who her and Lisa McManus hosted a three-week mathematical theory workshop that focused a lot on holobionts. It's bringing, bringing the concepts and bringing the math tools uh, to a bunch of uh, aspiring theoretical ecologists. Um, in Brazil, there was a school for advanced hologenomic data analysis. This conference, of course, happened two years ago. Um, the International Symbiosis Society has merged their meeting with Holobiont. Uh, uh, essentially, now it's going for, ever since a few years ago. It goes forward as the ISS slash Holobiont meeting. Um, so there's, there's a lot of confidence about what, what happens next and what we could all do to contribute to that. So I'll end with this quote once again from the same article that, that Carl Woese uh, wrote, which is, science is an endless search for truth any representation of reality we develop can only be partial. There is no finality, sometimes no single best representation. There is only deeper understanding, more revealing and envelop enveloping. And we are collectively here because we think holobionts are more revealing and enveloping. And that is just the reality of the biological world. So with that, I hope that's inspired a little bit of uh, momentum for us to all leave the conference. And if I have time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Seth. My that, pleasure. It was very inspiring. We do have time for a few questions. It's awkward if the fantastic Seth Bornstein doesn't get any questions. <laughs> Please, Rachel Carmody, good job. Uh, he's got a, uh, he's, uh, he's coming on left. That was totally inspiring. Thank you so much for an amazing Thank talk. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so you focus a lot you know, on um, how the microbiome or how the broader uh, non-host aspects of the holobiont are affecting the host. And, you know, for example, in humans, you mentioned that these immune genes are at the top of the list for uh, signals of positive selection. Yeah. But it seems to me that for the same reasons why the holobiont view is important, you know, signals of selection on the host are going to be embedded in microbial metagenomes mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. because these co-speciated communities are affecting um, phenotypes in predictable ways that persist over time. And of course, selection is acting on the phenotype. And so that's not going to be embedded in the host genome. That's going to be embedded in the microbial metagenome. And yes. I guess that's where you were going with saying we need to combine these genomes into a common resource. Yes. But I was wondering if you know of examples of um, research efforts anywhere that are going after the signals of selection on hosts that are embedded in microbial metagenomes. You know, there's, uh, I can think of one person doing that really well at UCLA. First, before I answer that, I'd like to just echo that I completely fundamentally agree that the, 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 the crumb trail is that we found that immunity genes are the most rapidly evolving and under selection. But the real story is, of course, why they got to be that point. And that's where holobiont biology then contributes. And that's what I think the old way of looking at the world has stopped at, unfortunately. And that's where we can pick it up. And so that's what I mean by the crumb trail leading us to really the, the gold mine. Um, now, the gold mine would be to then find what's evolving under selection in the microbiome. And this has been, I think, a tough challenge. And the lab I can think of is Nandita Garud's lab. She's an assistant professor at UCLA. And she studies gut microbiomes. And essentially, with gut microbiomes that are deeply sequenced and sampled enough, she can track in a longitudinal manage lineage, coder, lineage diversification, and then therefore the selective forces operating on those lineages at the SNP level. And I think it's ridden with assumptions and depth of sequencing issues, but she's taking the first crack at that. And with that, and once our sampling becomes sufficient, I think we'll have much bigger and better stories. And so maybe that's an opportunity for deeply sequenced samples would be to look at some of the work that's coming out of her lab because she's developing and using the tools in this manner. Um, but the stories are very nascent right now. Yeah. Did I disrupt the microphone? Maybe. Yeah, go for it. I, I, can I... Are you on? It's, it's not my area, but I think, Rachel, also the plant people are probably actually quite a few people doing that. You might want to check with them, but uh, they've been slightly more ahead in that area. Yeah. yeah so. Anyway, um, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so my question follows up a little bit on this and, and thinking about, yeah, rethinking uh, big ideas in biology. And one that I am really coming to terms with is an adaptationist framework. So of course, evolution, adaptation, and especially selection happens. Um, but I think there's also maybe more of a role for neutrality that we as a field are ignoring because we're drawn towards selection and because it's exciting or something. And so I heard a lot about selection in a lot of talks and I, I do wanna say there's difference between selection and species sorting. I think that's a great term that we as a field need to, to start using more uh, just to be explicit about what we're describing. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about drift and neutrality. Yeah. No, I, I echo that sentiment and have for a while now because the debates got really hyper-focused on whether the microbiome in association with the host or at all can be part of the selective unit. And to me, this always seemed crazy because the original concept laid out by the Rosenbergs always had neutrality in it uh, and everybody missed it. And um, in fact, 
it seems like neutrality is probably the rule rather than the exception. Be and I, I'm sure you, you've thought about this too, is that given that we all have very different taxonomic mi gut microbiomes, we're very individualistic in our gut microbiomes, but our metagenomic functions are essentially identical, that means a lot of species colonize us and essentially perform the same functions. And this is what we might think of as selectively neutral, or maybe there's another word for it, but it's sort of like alleles in the genome, the nuclear genome, coming and going randomly, but they perform the same function to our traits. And that is, of course, how a population geneticist would define uh, selective neutrality. And that most definitely is part, and if not a major story, of our variation in gut microbiome, variation of microbiomes in general. Um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. I think it's underappreciated. We don't have uh, people illuminating sort of the extent of that selective neutrality on, ver on explaining variation. Um, and if we do, I think, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. And so getting papers out there will, will calibrate people's thinking because there's been enough debating with reviews that it, the ideas are certainly put out there, but they seem to be glossed over. What we need now is, uh, as models. And I think Tom's group has actually, Thomas's group has, has put out models of neutrality for looking for whether microbiomes are at, behaving neutrally or not. Um, and so, yeah, I would look to some of that work as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to say anything? All right. Oh, yes, sorry. Well, one more. This will be the last one before I close. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the whole microbiome and holobiome concept has attracted um, interest uh, from philosophers, yeah. from scientist philosophers. I think uh, it's maybe it's about time that we should get involved a bit uh, more actively with these uh, scientists as well. Yeah, also. indeed. And some of, some of us here have. They've been in sort of working group meetings with philosophers on the meaning of individuality uh, in the organism and thinking about diverse perspectives from those angles. Um, and they've had some fun chats and even debates that are on YouTube. Um, and so I think Joan and Thomas could probably point you to some resources on that. I know they participate in a group like that. Um, so yeah, I fully, I, I fully agree. And for me, philosophy is fun. I really enjoy the way it stretches my mind. I, I'm less convinced that it offers me a new way about my experimentation but I'm certainly open-minded to that possibility, and I certainly enjoy the fun of having these perspective conversations. Part of the holobiont uh, kind of confusion for some people early on was what is it? Is it the new organismal level? You know, is it the new selection unit? And I always thought those were the wrong places to start, and they were coming from a philosophical angle because it naturally stems from there and generated confusion. The first place to start was the holobiont is an incontrovertible structure of reality. What it means is then for us up to figure out in each of our own systems. And that's where we actually might get different philosophical views on you know, what the stability or instability of a microbiome means to how we view that organism, individual, et cetera. But if you start from structure and structure determines function, you kind of stay in a very comfortable lane. And then philosophy can be sort of the step after to kind of round out the discussion. Looks like Thomas would like to say something short. Yes. Can't say no to Thomas. I was we banned from Holobiont world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the gatekeeper. As, um, I just want to, I think this is, uh, comes a bit late, but I think it's a very important contribution. I, I, I agree fully with you, but I would add, um, talking now to non-natural scientists, uh, which are including philosophers, but also Kevin made a strong point for artists, and this yeah. brings this field and the scientists and the experts uh, working on our specific models and high-tech issues back where we came from. We are all one nature. And f I needed philosophers to really make that clear to me. And artists that I showed in my introduction make that also very clear. Human is just part of that. We were driven in the last 100 years into this, into, into this road of we are being something very special. Mm -hmm. We are not special. And we need people like you and artists to, um, to bring us back where we came from, yeah. from, na from nature. Awesome. Super. Well, with that, another big thank you to Seth. Hey, thank, thank you. you Seth. All right.
And uh, with that, we come to the end. The wonderful Christina has made me a slide, just to wait for. But um, yes, so it is the end. Thank you so much. Uh, I personally am exhausted, um, not actually from running it, but the content has been so amazing that while I normally sit in conferences and uh, do my email and that kind of thing, I've been paying attention the whole time, and it's really been truly a great privilege to uh, hear so many wonderful ideas. So it's just been fabulous. So thank you so much to everybody for coming. It's really um, appreciated. I mean, uh, 